Hey everyone and welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Khalid Maidan. In today's video, we're going to be taking you through all you need to know on observation of the elbow joint. We're going to be breaking down your observation into an anterior, medial, lateral and posterior view. And we're going to be taking you through key pathologies in each of those views. So as to not slow your video down, we're going to be doing all our observation on one elbow. But it's vitally important in practice that you always compare the affected and unaffected sides. Before we get into observation of the elbow, we're going to be discussing key inflammatory signs as well as bony deformity, as it's always important to look out for these things when you're observing any joint. And just in case you've forgotten, the key three inflammatory signs are redness, swelling and bruising. So there are five key presentations in which you are highly likely to find inflammatory signs that every good clinician should be aware of. Number one is a trauma. With any trauma, your patient may suffer bony or soft tissue injury, such as a fracture or a ruptured muscle. Expect to find either swelling, bruising or deformity when observing the joint. For more severe cases, you may find more than one of these signs present. Number two is a bursitis which put simply is inflammation of a bursa. Some bursae are more easily seen when they are inflamed. For instance, olecranon bursitis, or student's elbow, can be easily visualized as the bursa is right beneath the subcutaneous layer of the skin. Others are not so easily visualized due to their anatomy. For instance, subacromial bursitis, where the bursa in question lies in a relatively deep position underneath the acromion. The amount of swelling seen therefore varies based on the anatomical site and the severity of inflammation. In the event of a bursitis, you may see redness on the skin and feel warmth on palpation. Always consider whether this could have been caused mechanically or whether an infection is responsible, in which case your patient may be systemically unwell. Number three is a tendonitis. When you look at the tendon in question, your patient may get swelling and redness in the most severe forms. Be aware though, don't rule out tendonitis if these signs are not present. You should also rely on your objectives, tests and mechanical signs. Number four is an infection or a cellulitis, where you may find redness or swelling, or in progressed cases even pus in the area of infection. Furthermore, look at your patient as a whole. Do they feel unwell or do they have a temperature? Finally, number five is arthropathies which can be categorised into osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis and crystal arthritis. For osteoarthritis, you may expect to find an enlarged swollen joint and in progressed cases, you may find hard swelling when you palpate the joint. With rheumatoid arthritis, you may find redness or swelling at the joint that you are assessing, as well as other joints, particularly the hands and the feet. The onset of rheumatoid arthritis is insidious so if your patient history indicates an absence of trauma, this should be considered a potential pathology. If you suspect this condition, you may wish to liaise with your patient's GP to conduct blood tests to rule out raised inflammatory markers. Crystal arthropathies represent a group of conditions associated with the deposition of mineralized material, mimicking crystals within joints and surrounding tissues. Gout and pseudogout are some of the most recognizable forms. These conditions present typically in a single large joint with redness and swelling and may well be warm to palpate. Like with rheumatoid arthritis, the important things to bear in mind are whether or not the onset of symptoms can be linked to a mechanical cause and whether mechanical aggravating or easing factors can be associated with the patient's symptoms. If not, a crystal arthropathy should be considered and the patient should consult with their GP for further investigation. So those are our inflammatory signs. Let's get into the main video. So we're going to start our observation of our patient's elbow with their elbow in an anterior view like so. And the first thing we're going to observe is the cubital fossa. Now in the center of the cubital fossa sits the distal biceps tendon. Now, whilst you can't necessarily see the tendon in this position, you could ask your patient to flex their elbow against your resistance and you might well just see it there. Now, if your patient has a very irritated distal biceps tendon, you may find swelling or even in some cases redness even before you do the resisted elbow flexion. Now, the next thing we're going to look at is the actual muscle belly of the biceps tendon. 
Again, if we ask our patient to flex their arm against our resistance, we'll see that the muscle belly sits in a central position along the humerus. However, if you're concerned about your patient having a long head of biceps tendon rupture, the muscle belly will move from its central position down to a distal position. This is called Popeye's sign. So make sure you look out for this if you suspect that your patient has a long head of biceps tendon rupture. Next, we're going to look at the uh, radial side of the forearm and the central uh, forearm here on the anterior surface to observe muscle tone. The main muscle that runs around the radial side is brachioradialis and the wrist flexor muscles run in the anterior compartment here. We're looking to see if there is any high or low tone of these particular muscles. And whilst this may not tell you exactly what is wrong with your patient, you can add it up with your other tests to form their clinical diagnosis. So now we're going to look at our patient's carrying angle of their elbow, which is akin to the Q angle in the lower limb. Now to observe this angle, we place our patient's elbow in full elbow extension like so. And the carrying angle is the angle that the radius and ulna in the uh, forearm sit in relation to the humerus. Now, if your patient does have an increased carrying angle, you can consider this alongside other tests in your patient's diagnosis, because there are certain things that an increased carrying angle may affect. So, for example, if your patient did have more pain along the medial side of the elbow with an increased carrying angle, we may hypothesize that this is putting more stress on the medial collateral ligament on the inside of the elbow. And so that's the way you might factor it into different conditions. So what else are we observing? Well, we can uh, have our patient's elbow fully extended in this position because we'd like to see the extension angle of the elbow. If your patient has an extension angle that goes beyond zero degrees and it's hypermobile, this may be a sign that your patient has hypermobility. We can also look at the epicondyles of the elbow. So we can look at the medial epicondyle uh, here on the very medial aspect of the elbow. And I'll just show you on our patient's other side, you can also look at the lateral epicondyle, which is on the very lateral aspect of the elbow. Both of these uh, points are bony ridges, which you, you should be able to easily palpate if you wished. And we're looking at these points to see if there may be any increase in swelling or redness. You may find these uh, presentations in very severe cases of a lateral epicondylitis, as it would be on the lateral aspect of the elbow, or medial epicondylitis, should it be on the medial side of the elbow. Next, we're going to look at the elbow in a posterior view. The main things that we can look at here are the olecranon. If your patient has had a trauma where they've fallen on the elbow, this may be a good place to look for any redness, swelling, bruising, or deformity. Another very pertinent condition is an olecranon bursitis, where you will find that your patient has a very distinct increase in swelling around the olecranon relative to the other side. And finally to look at here is the gap between the olecranon and just the distal triceps tendon. If you find a subtle gap of thinning in this area, this may be an indication of a triceps tendon rupture, say that a distal triceps tendon rupture. So here are the key points to summarize this video on elbow observation. Get used to breaking down your observation into an anterior, lateral, medial and posterior view, ensuring that you compare both affected and unaffected sides. When observing your patient, look for deformity and inflammatory signs which include redness, swelling and bruising. You can also look for signs of specific pathology as we've highlighted throughout the video. And that completes our video on observation of the elbow joint. Next, I'd like to suggest you have a look at other videos in the Clinical Physio Catalogue for elbow assessment, including palpation of the elbow. Thank you as always for watching, and we'll see you again on Clinical Physio.